everyone. It is Roxana Moran from Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. I'm thrilled uh, to be uh, on this PCR 2020 e-course and a very important and rather interesting topic of vasculogenic erectile dysfunction. This is a topic that's not usually covered in a uh, interventional meeting, but the truth is we don't ask, we don't talk, and they don't talk and those are our patients. And so let's dive into this and how perhaps we can, um, uh, we can address this important uh, question. Uh, it is important for you to note my disclosures, uh, really nothing specific to this topic, but uh, I, I have received uh, institutional grants uh, from uh, Concept Medical through CERC. Thank you. So let's begin. Uh, this is really an important issue and, uh, and it has an incredible, incredible impact. Erectile dysfunction has an incredibly important impact on the quality of life of, of men in this, in this world. Uh, it affects self-esteem, depression, important relationships, and uh, it may have an important impact on long-term outcomes of of some of the patients. What is it? It is defined as recurrent inability to achieve and maintain an, er an, an erection satisfactory for sexual intercourse. This is a common disorder. It is primarily affected uh, to elderly men, but not really elderly, over the age of 40. And it is becoming a major health problem especially with our increasingly healthy elderly aging population. The worldwide prevalence of erectile dysfunction is estimated to actually increase from 152 million cases in 1995 to 322 million by 2025. A large numbers of these patients actually do have ischemic heart disease, and, cardi and cardiovascular and atherosclerotic disease. And many of these patients, of course, are suffering from important erectile dysfunction, but they rarely, rarely reported. What are some of the risk factors and what, do, what should we look for and perhaps maybe even start a dialogue with our patients? First of all, obviously very important is the vascular disorders associated with uh, as a risk factor for erectile dysfunction, including atherosclerosis and even venous disease. Diabetes is a very, very important, next most important risk factor. Medications, uh, important to ask about medications, especially beta blockers. Patients who have had pelvic surgery, radiation or trauma. And then there are important neurologic and endocrine uh, causes as well and important risk factors that are associated with this disorder. But the truth is that the common myths surrounding this important disorder has um, really stopped us discussing it with our patients. Mostly patients believe that nothing can be done. Um, maybe, you know, you take pills, but maybe nothing can be done. And it's an expectation. This should be occurring because um, this is my age, I'm getting older, and that is what, what it's supposed to be. And very importantly, very importantly, much of erectile dysfunction has been attributed to psychological issues and mind over matter. And the fact is that that's a very huge myth, uh, especially if we don't really, really understand the underlying cause of this important disorder that so vastly affects the quality of life of our patients. If we think about it, when we treat stable ischemic heart disease with intervention, we're really, really improving the quality of life of our patients in reducing angina frequency, et cetera. So treating and evaluating and addressing erectile dysfunction, especially if there is important atherosclerosis, can have a massive impact on the quality of life of our male patients with atherosclerotic disease. What is needed for a normal erectile function uh, is an intact nervous system network, sufficient blood flow, so good 
excellent blood flow uh, with uh, no um, uh, blockages uh, and very important intact healthy cavernosal tissue as well as normal venous drainage. So it's a, a really important series of uh, multitudes of uh, different places that you have to sort of think about. And for us as interventionalists, what can we do? How can we as cardiologists be able to help our male patients with erectile dysfunction? Is there a place? Well, this is really uh, the major topic of our, um, of our symposium today. Because there is such an important linkage between erectile dysfunction and cardiovascular disease that we really need to kind of understand this, this disorder in a much more open fashion with our male patients. First of all, the age, age diabetes, hypertension, alcohol, and tobacco, all, all important risk factors. And there's this important endothelial dysfunction plus atherosclerosis that could have an important impact on erectile dysfunction. It is the reason why 46% of men with CAD and more than 85% of con congestive heart failure patients were reported to have erectile dysfunction, as you can see from the references I've listed here. And then of men uh, with erectile dysfunction, 75% of those uh, will have problems achieving or even maintaining uh, erection. So it's a really important issue. Uh, the onset of symptomatic cardiovascular disease in those patients who have erectile dysfunction could be as, as well as preceding it uh, by, by three years. So in some ways, that could be an area where you could focus to actually improve cardiovascular disease and understanding the risk factors behind that, that we will discuss at this uh, session today. And then of course, there has been reports that uh, erectile dysfunction actually increases the risk of cardiovascular disease for both myocardial infarction and overall mortality. Now, that is something interesting to kind of look at. We don't usually co collect the, that information, but should we now be more open in, in really understanding this important disorder that affects so many of our male patients? So today on this wonderful symposium, I have two of the leading experts who have played an important role in, in understanding this dis disorder and making an important uh, um, uh, contribution to perhaps a percutaneous management uh, using our interventional techniques and our vascular techniques. And with me today, I have Professor Gius Giuseppe San Giorgi uh, from uh, San Godzino uh, Clinic in Novario, uh, uh, the Department of Systemic Medicine and Department of um, Cardiology, University of Rome. Uh, I'm, I'm really, really thrilled to have my dear friend Massimo uh, or Giuseppe San Giorgi here with us today. And then Professor Nicholas Diem, who's founder and medical director of the Vascular Institute in central Switzerland. Uh, we're really, really excited to have both of you here uh, today uh, on this important um, uh, PCR e-course. And I wanna really, really thank PCR for allowing us to have this a uh, wonderful uh, session. Uh, in our agenda today, what we will do is we will begin with Dr. San Giorgi, who will uh, really um, tell us how cardiologists should approach patients with erectile dysfunction. And Professor uh, Diem will talk about some of the treatment of erectile dysfunction beyond uh, um, pharmacology, but more, more importantly into uh, some percutaneous techniques using balloons and stents. And then we'll go to some real cases with some real, um, some real experience and uh, some tips and tricks on some of the techniques that are needed if you are gonna take this on as a possibility of helping some of the patients. And then we'll open it up to some discussion. I'm really, really thrilled. Uh, we will have some closing and key messages at the end of this uh, webinar. But um, more importantly, we hope that through this webinar, we will actually enlighten you with understanding the crossover between cardiovascular disease and erectile dysfunction, the ability of how cardiologists could come in and have an important dialogue with their patients regarding this important disorder, and then some of the treatment options uh, using um, uh, some balloons, stents, and wire technologies that, that our uh, very uh, uh, expert panel here 
uh, will lead us to. So thank you so much. We'll have a wonderful session in front of us. And uh, for now, I'd like to first present Professor Giuseppe San Giorgi, who will talk about how cardiologists may actually uh, approach patients in evaluation of erectile dysfunction in their practices. Dr. San Giorgi, welcome. Thank you, Roxana, and it's an honor for me to be here with you and uh, Professor Diem, and of course, the, uh, Euro PCR to uh, give the opportunity to share some glimpses about uh, this uh, pathology. We will uh, uh, see what is the role as a cardiologist in uh, the diagnosis of uh, uh, vasculogenic uh, uh, erectile dysfunction. These are my conflict of interest. I also received some institutional grants from uh, Concept Medical. Uh, first of all, uh, of course, everything starts from uh, the clinical history and the sexual history should always be conducted in a sensitive manner, uh, taking into account individuals' backgrounds and uh, lifestyles, uh, the status of the partner relationship, and uh, of course, our uh, personal comfort and experience with uh, this particular topic. Uh, I believe that sexual inquiry should be incorporated into all new patient encounters as a cardiologist due to the fact that as Professor Meran was uh, saying, there is a very uh, tight link between cardiovascular disease and erectile dysfunction. And you know, you can start with two very easy and simple questions. Uh, first of all, asking to uh, your patient if he's uh, sexually active and uh, or if uh, he has some sexual concerns or problem that uh, he would like to discuss with you. Uh, Moving into a more specific uh, problem, uh, there are some reasons given by patients and of course uh, us as a physician for not taking a sexual history. Uh, of course, you have to realize that there is a sense of embarrassment and shame uh, from the patient side. There is a society taboo against an open discussion of uh, uh, sexuality and especially they are uncertain whether sexual problems are part of the healthcare. And uh, of course, they are also not feeling optimistic about the outcome of such discussion. Uh, from our side, we do have time constraints in our busy clinical practice, uh, especially female doctors, they there is an unrealistic fear of offending the patients and, of course, deficit in uh, communicating skills. So you have to keep this in mind and teach your fellows that uh, this type of uh, clinical history is uh, very, very important in our routine uh, cardiology practice. Uh, so, going a little bit deeper inside the problem, you should ask if the patient has difficulty in obtaining an erection, whether the erection is suitable for penetration, whether the erection can be maintained, whether ejaculation occurs, and of course, if both partners experience sexual uh, satisfaction. Uh, I think that the problem is uh, summarized in these slides. You can have two types of uh, uh, different stories that the patient tells you. First of all, a patient can say that he has a tumescence and penetration problem, and you are uh, dealing with arterial insufficiency in this case. A second scenario is that the patient can tell you that, that he has tumor sense, but the erection is not lasting. And so he has erection maintaining problem. And this, of course, you are dealing in this scenario, in this second case, with venous insufficiency. Of course, you can have both case scenario. And so we are talking about mixed insufficiency. Uh, Moving on a more uh, uh, diagnostic uh, uh, now pathway, uh, the first thing is to provide the patient with a very simple questionnaire, which is called International Index of Erective Function, 
There are five questions exploring the erectile uh, status of the patient. And you can have, uh, you know, a point from one to five for each question. So very low from very high. And of course, you can have uh, no uh, erectile dysfunction. Uh, the score is between 26 and 30. A uh, very high uh, deficiency from 17 to 25 up to severe erectile dysfunction, uh, 6 to 10 as a score. And this takes uh, one minute. Then we can move. Usually the patient, uh, if they come to you because you are um, the uh, specialist that uh, you're uh, going to treat them with a dynamic doppler. What means dynamic? You do a basal doppler, so a baseline status, and then you inject the cover jet. This is usually done by andrologists or urologists. So you will have this type of examination that the patient will bring you into your outpatient clinic. And you can have, uh, again, three different situations, an inflow, so an arterial insufficiency, where you have a peak systolic velocity less than 25 centimeters second, and the uh, um, end diastolic velocity less than five centimeters per second. You can have a venous problem where the peak systolic velocity is normal, above 25, uh, while the uh, end diastolic velocity is greater than five. And then, of course, you can have, as in the previous slides, a mixed uh, pathology, which is uh, characterized by a PSV less than 25 and ADV uh, more than five. Uh, then of, uh, uh, you can move along this pathway with an angel CT. In the angio CT, you can clearly see how beautiful image you can uh, get with this uh, uh, technology. Uh, I usually recommend to uh, colleagues to start with this type of examination in the interventional cardiology practice due to the fact that, as you will see, the anatomy is quite complex in this uh, segment of the body and the angio CT will help you a lot in identify the uh, pudendal and especially the origin of the pudendal artery due to the fact that uh, there are uh, a variability, a high variability in uh, pudendal artery origin. Basically, the angio CT will identify you atherosclerotic disease if present in zone 4A, so proximal pudendal, zone 4B, mid pudendal, or distal pudendal, zone 5A and 5B into the uh, dorsalis penis artery. Uh, as you will see in the uh, uh, next slide, uh, usually this is the location of the atherosclerosis, and this has been demonstrated by Dr. Wang from uh, Taiwan. Uh, by Professor Diem, by myself, in uh, other uh, papers, uh, uh, the majority of the uh, stenosis will be localized in the uh, distal pudendal, so zone 4B at the angio CT, and in the common penile artery, so zone 5A. You can see that more than 60% of the cases are localized in uh, this anatomical setting. Then moving into the uh, cat lab, what we usually do in our routine clinical practice is not only to do a contrast angiography, but uh, a CO2, so an angiography with uh, a CO2. Uh, you can see that this is the uh, pressure and volume that we inject as a contrast the CO2 uh, angiography. And you can have two situations, a normal CO2 distribution, uh, due to the fact that the CO2, it's uh, the viscosity of CO2 due to the fact that it's a gas, it's much less compared to contrast. And you can clearly see in this example that you can evaluate the cavernous body very well in panel A and panel B. While the patient in panel C and panel D, you can see at the contrast angiography, we don't have visualization of the cavernous body. And this means you a very important thing that the patient has probably an increased fibrotic covering tissue, which is very difficult to solve. So they probably need to be submitted 
to uh, penile implantation because nothing can be done even if we do a, a percutaneous uh, intervention in this clinical scenario. Then moving on the projection that uh, we need to utilize in, during normal uh, procedure, uh, we start usually with the AP projection to uh, identify the uh, pudendal artery to move on the homolateral 45 degrees caudal projection that will give you this uh, still frame picture that you see. And the pudendal artery is recognized because, as you can see, it's uh, characterized by the fact that curves around the bladder that you have in the uh, center and the distal part of the pudendal artery is uh, uh, very well seen because it's uh, prolonged uh, along the uh, contrast angiography. Then, of course, you have to tailor a different projection, another projection that we utilize in many cases, the homolateral 45 degrees cranial. But I'm telling you that moving along your uh, practice, you will learn how to uh, best get uh, the visualization of the pudendal arteries in different projections. So you cannot really standardize uh, how to uh, visualize uh, the pudendal arteries due to the fact that there is a variability. So uh, I am concluding that I believe that we as a cardiology should always take in sexual history during our patient examination. The rule has Roxana said, if we don't ask, they don't say, it's always true in this uh, clinical setting. IF questionnaire and dynamic doctor examination are usually sufficient to make diagnosis of sort of vasculogenic, either arteriosal or venous erectile dysfunction. And of course, uh, finally and last but not least, the angio CT and CO2 angiography should complete the track and give detailed information on atherosclerotic disease presence and healthy status of the cavernous body. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. San Giorgi. What a wonderful uh, lecture. And I think uh, it really kind of, uh, you know, uh, the questions that you want us to ask as cardiologists are still very, very difficult uh, to, to have those kinds of questions, especially uh, if the cardiologist happened to be a woman. And as a woman, I can tell you that this is very difficult and the patients could have a, a difficulty discussing that. So I think, what do you suggest, um, you know, how do you, how do you do that then? Uh, do you suggest that there is some other question, some like uh, physician assistants or nurses or somebody else who could, uh, who could have those questions? And then secondly, is it always a CT scan is the first thing you go to? Uh, Roxana, my experience, the, you know, what I suggest to my female uh, fellow is, you know, to start explaining why we're asking this question. So for instance, if you say to a male patient, uh, how is your uh, sexual status? This is important due to the fact that there is a very tight relationship between coronary artery disease and peripheral artery disease with uh, uh, erectile status, they are more willing to open. And I agree with you, you know, uh, a male will be embarrassed to discuss this type of problem in front of female uh, physician, uh, men and men with yeah. child. So but, do you do a CT scan first if you, uh, if you suspect that this is happening? You this is what we were, we were doing in our practice at the beginning due to the fact that, as I told you, the anatomic variability is uh, great. Uh, we don't do it anymore. Honestly speaking, uh, it's sufficient to have a, a positive IF, so less than uh, 15 as a score, and a positive Doppler. Uh, again, you introduce a variability in the dynamic Doppler, but you know, most of the time, uh, this is uh, more than sufficient to bring the patient to the cath lab. Well, thank you again. That was really very enlightening. We're going to move now to Professor Dam, who's going to show us some uh, some of the 
details of about the treatment op options and some of the treatment modalities. Professor Diem, welcome. Thank you very much, Roxana. It's great to be part of this uh, exciting e-conference. Before we dive deeper into endovascular therapy for ED, I want to make once more the point that sexuality is not a matter of age. There are two guidelines, one from urology and one from the NIH saying that whenever a man complains about ED, this is a medical matter. So this is very important to begin with. When I started working on ED patients as a, an interventional vascular physician, I did not really know, to be honest, that PDE5 uh, inhibitors have no or suboptimal responses in terms of achieving adequate erection in up to 50% of patients. And five, 600 interventions later now, I, what we really are seeing is that especially these patients with suboptimal or no response to PDE5 inhibitors, those are the vascular patients that are worthwhile uh, performing angiograms in. In addition, relevant side effects occur in up to 25% of patients on PDE5 inhibitor medication. So this is one of the early and important studies out of the United States, the PANPI study showing that in patients undergoing a coronary angiogram, patients not responding to PDE5 inhibitors, the likelihood of a presence of an arterial obstruction of erection-related artery, as Massimo uh, already outlined, mostly in the pudendal artery, is quite high. So there's a direct link between CAD and ED of arterial origin. This is an own experience we published last year in the, in the Journal of Endovascular Therapy. It's an all-comers quality control investigation so these are unselected patients. We did have 20% of diabetics in there. We did have patients that had undergone a radical prostatectomy. We did have patients, beta blockers, all kinds of things you would probably not want to have in a randomized trial. So 50 patients with 82 lesions treated with all kinds of anti resthenolic modalities, POBA, drug-coated balloons, and more and more drug eluting stents from April 2016 to uh, October 2017. And we looked at primary safety and uh, uh, more importantly, we looked at clinical outcomes in as much as the primary feasibility endpoint was defined in line with previous publications as so-called MCID, minimal clinical relevant improvement. That's again related to the functional score mentioned by Massimo Zanjorgi. And we applied earlier endpoints utilized in um, the PDE5 inhibitor literature utilized about 20 years ago. So these are just the procedural characteristics. I'm not going to go into greater detail. These lesions are like coronary type lesions. Uh, the diameter of the arteries to be treated is probably slightly um, smaller when compared with coronary lesions, but other than that lesion length um, is, um, is pretty comparable to coronary lesions. This is probably the most important slide. So in these 50 all comers, we obtained clinical improvement in about two thirds of patients at three months and with a non-significant drop to 65% out to 12 months. So whenever you uh, reach an adequate result, um, it's probably gonna stay in the line with uh, Later observations, restenosis rates are not that high, utilizing mostly drug eluting stents in our center. However, we have sort of a black box in the sense of indications. So having included all kinds of patients, as I alluded to, we still don't know which are the patients that we better don't treat. So this certainly needs to be elucidated in the future. This is just to show you our results when compared with uh, what I call the Viagra study endpoints, sort of a softer endpoint definition. And uh, for these patients, we have close to 80% of success going by the, Viagra, uh, by the Viagra definition of clinical success. So one of the central questions then pops up is when you're starting to do cases, which type of anti 
modality you're going to apply. Mostly, as indicated earlier by Roxana, you have patients starting by the age of 40, sometimes uh, even younger. So um, which anti restenosis technology you're going to use? This is um, what, we, what we discussed initially. Um, in, especially in younger patients, you may probably not want to leave something behind and uh, DEB seems favorable. However, the pathophysiology of small vessel restenosis, also in the tibial arteries, is not really understood. In coronary trials about 20 years ago, there was a high percentage of recoil observed. This is why stents and later drug eluding stents have been introduced. Also in tibial arteries, if you wait 10-15 minutes subsequent to your POBA or DEB angioplasty, you will get a lot of recoil. And this is why we studied uh, arterial recoil in ED patients. This is just a clinical example of a proximal pudendal lesion in a young patient, which we treated initially with POBA, and uh, it looked great uh, for the acute result. But then if you wait a little uh, longer, after 10 minutes, you see you already get a significant recall of that distal portion of that lesion. And this is why you ultimately will end up utilizing a permanent mechanical scaffold, especially since you also have to show to many referring physicians and to many urologists that the mechanism of revascularization works, because this is something, in my experience, that many urologists don't even uh, believe you. So again, we published these um, results. Again, summarized, elastic recoil is quite frequent. This is why personally I decided in my hands that we treat most patients, except for very young patients with inflammatory disorders, such as those caused by cannabis, for example, but I'm currently advocating a primary DES strategy for most patients. So to come to my conclusions, whenever you see a patient that does not respond well to PDE5 inhibitors or KBER check, there's a high likelihood that this is going to be a vascular patient. And endovascular therapy is a good treatment option in especially those patients not responding to conservative uh, treatment options. However, we have a certain black box in the terms of which patients respond best to this um, interesting therapy. And yet the anti best anti restenotic concept for these often thin arteries in young patients needs to be further investigated. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Diem. What a wonderful uh, experience you shared with us. And I was really um, uh, intrigued by, by your experience. And, and uh, this, these are not easy procedures because even though they seem somewhat easy, it's sort of the access is a little bit tricky. It's not something we're used to. Uh, the vessels are smaller. They may be more friable. Um, but what I liked about your conclusion was that you first go in the conservative management and that you really are uh, not advocating that we should be proceeding to uh, interventional treatments or are you? Can you expand on that a little bit? So you really want to give a of the course of medical management, a way to work, and then if not that, that if it's not the case, then you dig deeper. It seemed from me, uh, from the talk by um, uh, Dr. St. Georgie, that maybe um, you know we could uh, avert all the problems and maybe get a CT scan or some uh, other evaluation and proceed directly to some uh, treatment, endovascular treatment options. You want to expand on that, on how you approach that? I think given the, the current literature that is, that is out there, which, which is a lack of a randomized trial when compared to treatment, I think it's reasonable to, to do it this way. However, you have to keep in mind that, that the, the rate of side effects is quite high utilizing both PD-5 inhibitors and also KBER check. So in the, ultimately you will end up treating many, many patients with endovascular means, probably more than any urologist at present would, would consider. However, yes, we, we don't stand anyone. I wanna make another point because um, Max, you said you, you're gonna, you stopped doing CAT scans. And I, I feel we just published a paper on collateral findings. Whenever you do a CAT scan on an arterial ED patient, there's a lot of things you can find. 
We even find thoracic aneurysms that previously went undiagnosed. We found hypogastric aneurysms, all kinds of things that would certainly then change the, the treatment pathway of the patient from purely lifestyle indication to cardiovascular, say, prevention of a hypogastric aneurysm rupture, for example. So personally, I feel, although we never do this as peripheral interventionalists, CAT scan is very, very important in these patients. And it's interesting, you said peripheral interventionalist. Do you think that this is just limited to peripheral interventionalists, interventional radiologists, vascular surgeons? No, no, not at all. I think it's, it's, this field is open to anyone willing to discuss with patients about the, uh, the issue of erectile dysfunction. Well, thank you so much. That was a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, talk and with great uh, uh, examples on, and treatment options. But let's now get to some real cases. Let's start with Professor San Giorgi. He has a case to show us, a case or two, I think. And uh, we'll, we'll go back then again to you, Professor Diem, and then we'll have a little small discussion because obviously uh, we're interested in this because uh, we should be designing a definitive prospective randomized trial uh, before we start speaking too excited, getting too excited about the percutaneous management. And we'll discuss that as well. So let's begin with you, Dr. San Giorgi. Show us some of the cases. Okay. <clears throat> so we were discussing with Roxana in the preparation of this event, and uh, she was wondering if we could also do CTO. And actually, the first case that I want you to present is uh, CTO cases. And this was a 61 years old hypertensive, diabetic, uh, non-insulin dependent for 10 years, but uh, when he was admitted to our institution was insulin dependent and hypercholesterolemic, so very, the usual cardiovascular risk factors. He had in 2017 and uh, non-SFI with two dry gluten stents on LAD and LCX. Uh, he suffered erectile dysfunction since 2016, not responding anymore to PDA5 inhibitors for eight months. He was taking chalice 20 milligrams on demand plus the once daily chalice five milligrams. IF5 score was eight, so severe erectile dysfunction. And of course he was submitted to uh, selective uh, pudendal angiography. And this was the situation. You can see the catheter is placed into the uh, internal iliac artery. You have the external gluteal artery. And where the arrow indicates is where is the pudendal origin. And as you can see, this was a, a total occlusion that was uh, crossed with uh, a samurai uh, wire uh, with the help of uh, a balloon. Uh, then we treated uh, this uh, thigh stenosis uh, with uh, Magic Touch ED, which is a Sirolimus eluding balloon. And actually in Europe, uh, this is the uh, only balloon that has a C mark for treatment of uh, uh, erectile uh, dysfunction. And in this particular case, we utilize a 2.0 20 millimeter a balloon for uh, three minutes. And uh, uh, here it is the uh, pudendal. Uh, this is the final result. Index, uh, I told you the IF5 uh, was eight and the patient at six months move up to 22. So uh, back to the normal. And one thing that I would like to underline, and I think also for Nicholas is exactly the same, uh, we now are treating only patients who do not respond anymore who, to PDA-5 for at least six months in agreement with uh, our uh, urologist colleagues. To give you just a brief glimpse of this uh, uh, technology, so the Sirolimus cellulin balloon technology, uh, the uh, conversion of the Sirolimus drug into sub-micron size particle is the first step then there is encapsulation of uh, the uh, submicron serolimus into very highly uh, biocompatible um, drug carrier, which is made by phospholipids, so able to 
uh, move into the uh, vessel wall and cross the uh, endothelial uh, barrier. And then, of course, uh, once sirolimus is transferred into the vessel wall via coefficient diffusion, it's uh, delivered into the uh, vessel wall. And uh, on the upper right corner, you have a paper published in your intervention in 2013, where the sirolimus was banded to uh, uh, staining, a fluorescent staining. And you can clearly see that at seven days, sirolimus it's accumulating in the intima layer to move up at 14 days into the medial layer and at 30 days into the uh, adventitia. So this technology seems to work uh, really, really uh, well. Uh, the second case that I would like to uh, show you, it's a 54 years old, uh, again, diabetic, hypertensive, uh, but normal cholesterolemic. He had no cardiovascular uh, events uh, uh, in the uh, previous year. He underwent coronary angio CT, which was negative. He was affected by erectile dysfunction since 2018, not responding again to PDA5 uh, since one year. Uh, also, the patient was submitted by the uh, urologist to uh, low intensity shockwave therapy, which is another second line therapy that is approved by the uh, guidelines uh, due to the fact that it has been demonstrated that it creates neovascularization within the cavernous body. But unfortunately, the patient did not have any beneficial effect. Again, severe rectal dysfunction, IF score was five. Again, submitted to selective uh, pudendal angiography. And uh, you can clearly see a very diffuse disease in uh, uh, zone uh, 5A and 4B. So mid uh, pudendal angiography outlined by the uh, first right panel and distal pudendal angiography outlined by the right uh, lower panel. Uh, now, this is the uh, LAO45 caudal, caudal projection that we utilize to implant uh, drug eluding stand 2.518 in uh, uh, zone uh, for uh, B. And uh, of course, we, as I told you, you have to tailor the uh, projection. We uh, utilize uh, a non compliant 2.515 uh, balloon in order to optimize the, the drug eluding stent implantation. As you can see, we move into the 60 degrees cranial uh, view. But you can also clearly uh, see that, uh, besides the fact that uh, there is a stenosis in the proximal part that uh, we optimize, there is a really a diffuse disease in the distal part of the pudendal artery and common penile artery. And we, in this particular cases, we always utilize a, a sirolimus saluting balloon stent that we inflate for uh, more than two minutes. And this is the result on the uh, right panel of uh, the, uh, this uh, mechanical revascularization. Uh, we're going to present in the Euro PCR uh, a registry. Uh, we have a preliminary result. It's called the Suation Study. So, Sirolimus in balloon in vasculogenic erectile dysfunction. The usual efficacy endpoints and safety endpoints that you have seen that Nicolas has utilized in his uh, personal experience. However, in the first 27 patients that were enrolled, uh, so far, again, very nice results. Patient who did not respond anymore to PDA5 at the six months, 70.4% have an improvement in IF score of at least five points. So we are moving to a severe to a moderate or light erectile dysfunction. And you can also see the improvement in the uh, peak systolic velocity at the uh, Doppler examination. Last but not least, we have mentioned about the possibility to do a randomized study. This is a randomized study that uh, we're going to start in autumn together with uh, Professor Meran and uh, <laughs> Professor Diem uh, with a sham arm because we believe that uh, we need to solve the problem that many urologists believe that uh, uh, ED 
It's caused in more than 30, 40% of cases by psychological uh, problems. And so we're gonna utilize the sham procedure to uh, you know, discover if uh, indeed there is this type of effect. And uh, this trial, which is called Lipido, uh, will start in the uh, next autumn. And I thank you very much, Roxana, and uh, the people for your attention. Thank you. Thank you again. We're going to kind of running out of time. And Professor Diem, you have like five minutes to present your cases. So let's get going. So this is just a very short one, actually just one slide, a clinical vignette on gluteal claudication and arterial ED, because um, in my experience, about one third of patients suffer from both. So whenever you ask them for a potential arterial ED, be it a CAD patient or a PAD patient, ask for gluteal claudication, because on the right-hand side, you can see an arterial obstructive pattern that is quite frequently observed an obstruction of the inferior gluteal and in about one third of patients the pudendal artery would come right off that inferior gluteal artery so whenever you have a proximal obstruction you may have both gluteal claudication and arterial erectile dysfunction so think of that already when you start uh, interviewing your patients for ed so this for me, as, a, as a, a peripheral interventionalist, the most intriguing thing about seeing ED patients is that you see many, many patients in whom you would never believe that they have atherosclerosis, to be honest. You are more used to seeing these younger coronary patients. Usually, as peripheral interventionalists, we see patients at the age of 65, 70, and we have highly calcified iliacs and femoral popliteal arteries. However, this is a remarkable case of a 51-year-old former Premier League Swiss soccer professional. Physically, I kept, keep saying probably better, in better shape um, than his treating physician, myself. So his previous cardiovascular risk factors were a positive family history of cardiovascular disease. We utilized the IIF15 questionnaire. It contains of 15 questions, but points at a very similar direction as that alluded to by Max, and he had severe ED and did not respond to PDE5 inhibitors. And we worked him up and uh, we found a, an impaired penile perfusion subsequent to K-reject um, installation and a high cholesterol level. Re remember this is a former soccer player. He hadn't been for physical examinations for a while. So cholesterol, especially LDL was elevated. And we performed a CT angiogram showing a significant calcification of the right Pudendal artery, uh, no coronary artery calcification. And this is the angiogram showing a very limited length, but still significant stenosis of the right distal pudendal artery that we treated. As I mentioned, I mostly use thin strut uh, drug eluting stents such as the abluminous stent, for example. Nice result with this stent and the patient did uh, significantly better. In, in my experience, even these younger patients may, not all of them, but may even get away from not requiring PDE5 medications anymore. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much to uh, the both of you, really enlightening us on a topic that is not uh, commonly covered. Uh, I think what we learned today is that uh, Erectile dysfunction is common. It is uh, really affecting the quality of life of our patients, our male patients. It can be treated. It should be evaluated. It takes an interdisciplinary approach by working with the cardiologists, maybe the urologists who happen to see these patients, especially if the, uh, if the first line of treatment is medical but then very, very importantly is an open dialogue and discussion. These questionnaires are easy. I think they're easier to deploy rather than an oral conversation so that they can be done in a very quiet, private manner where the patient can feel comfortable in honestly answering those questions. And then the workup we talked about today uh, of both uh, evaluating and giving a conservative management up front, but then with CT scanning or moving forward with a pudental artery angiography to evaluate what, what the issue is. And then we saw treatment modalities using drug-coated balloons and even stents 
of ultra thin uh, 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 stents because these are really small friable arteries. We saw a CTO that was open. So there is a lot of really good hope. And then importantly, this big, large randomized trial that's gonna be undertaken with, um, with uh, Concept Medical supporting that trial with the sham arm, I think is gonna be the most important definitive trial to really open up this field because we have seen others um, engage in this field, but not really uh, successfully proceed. And hopefully this could be a, a really, really good way for improving quality of life for our male patients with cardiovascular and atherosclerotic pudental artery disease. Thank you again uh, uh, for your contributions. And this was a fantastic, fantastic group. Thank you.